So today's uh, Torah study, well, well I guess welcome to uh, the third in this semester series of Torah studies. This Torah study, it will be about confidentiality. Now, I know this is actually a topic that here in law school uh, everyone deals with. And in fact, is you'll see on the last page, um, has been a source of conflict for rabbis um, uh, who have dealt with issues of confidentiality in America, you know, with with the religious uh, beliefs and American law. There is a famous case um, of two rabbis who were sued by uh, one of their one of the congregants. We'll get to there at the end, which you'll see on the page for the, the addendum was the, um, the a, two rabbis and a lawyer. One is the head of the Bezdin, Bezdin is the Jewish courts of America. One is another head, and one is a famous lawyer. They put together a series of recommendations that try to uh, combine both, I guess, the legal uh, recommendations together with the rabbinic or the religious uh, obligations. So we'll, let's go through the basic overview of confidentiality um, according to the Torah. Now, I, you know, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that in secular, you know, in American law, the concept of confidentiality has two um, aspects. One is for evidence. That means if something was told in confidence, and that confidence is protected, that knowledge or that fact cannot be brought into evidence. Okay? So that obviously the Torah has very little to say there, because the Torah is not you know, telling the American court system how to run their courts and how to, you know, what led to evidence. The question is, there's a second area of confidence, or something told in private, or some uh, knowledge or gain through that means, is the concept of the right of the person who revealed it. That means, um, if I, if they, again, it started obviously with confession in the Catholic Church, that's where it started from, that's where common law got it from, eventually it made its way to all religions, and then to, all, to, to other areas, but it definitely started as common law um, from the concept of confession, that I, who reveal something to you, I have a right, it's my right that what I reveal to you stays mine, and therefore you have no right to reveal it further. And therefore, if you go ahead and reveal what I told you further, you have, in other words, you have, you have destroyed, irrelevant of, of court case or evidence, you have destroyed you know, my right, you've taken away my right. So the question is, what is this right? How does the Torah approach this concept of the right of someone to reveal something to the information that he revealed to, to, to remain his. So, the, the first source, on page one, is for the Talmud in Yoma, and it starts off with quoting the first verse in Leviticus, that should be one one, not one exclamation point. That's what happens if you leave the shift on a little bit for an extra second. And the Lord called on to Moses and spoke unto him. And, and, and the end of the verse, we'll see then, is he spoke to him saying, you have that many times, throughout the Torah, where God will speak to Moses, and he'll say to him, I said this to you saying, in Hebrew the word is lamor. And, and when I was, you know, in, when really, even though the word in lamor is translated saying, the root is aleph memresh, which means to say, which means that God said to Moses, to say over. That means you don't always, in the story, you don't always have that God told Moses X, Y, Z, and then Moses went and told the Jewish people X, Y, Z. But if the word lamar, to say, is included in God speaking to Moses, what it was, it was an automatic assumption that he would go ahead and repeat it to the, to the people. So there are two, um, and this, again, Leviticus, for the word, obviously, Le Le Levite, or Le Levite, that Leviticus is all about the laws of uh, Levites, of Kohen, and priests, all the laws of the temples of the service. So the introduction was that the Lord called him and spoke to him. So why does scripture mention the call before the speech of Talmud asks? The Torah teaches us good manners. A man should not address his neighbor without having first called him. Right? God could have got it should have started on God's God. He could have just started talking to Moses and Moses should listen. But God has good manners, and he teaches us good manners, and that you should you should call the person first and says, Moses, I'd like to speak to you. This supports the view of Hanina for Hanina said, No man shall speak to his neighbor unless he calls him first to speak to him. Okay. Rabba said, this is what we're going to focus on. Whence do we know that if a man has said something to his neighbor, the latter must not spread the news without the informant telling him, go and say it? In other words, where do we know the concept of confidentiality? If I tell you something, you may not go ahead and say it to somebody else unless I give you permission. 
The answer is from the text. The Lord spoke to him out of the tent of meeting, Lamar, saying, meaning go and say. So the Talmud and Yoma learns from here that you may not repeat a conversation, a private conversation, God and Moses, unless as God explicitly instructs you to go ahead and go and say it. Okay. So that's source number one. The truth is, there's a, a more basic source, and that is in Leviticus 19, verse 16. You shall not go around as a gossip monger amidst your people. You shall not go, and you should not go ahead and tell over gossip. You should not go ahead and tell over things that you heard from somebody else. The Maimonides, the third source, um, codifies this. A person who collects gossip about a colleague violates a prohibition. As Leviticus states, do not go around gossiping amongst your people. Says Allah, who is a gossiper? One who collects information and then goes from person to person saying, this is what so-and-so said. This is what I heard about so-and-so. Even if the statements are true. Now, we would think gossip monger is someone who goes ahead and tells things that are not true. No, it's irrelevant. Either it's 100% true or 100% correct. And, and you know it to be factual. You may not, there's a prohibition, you may not go ahead and, and repeat it. They bring about the destruction of the world. So the, the, the rabbis especially um, <clears throat> have explained that this, this prohibition, not to be a gossip monger, not to tell over factual information further on, is really one of the worst sins that can be done. In, there, is much, this, there is a much more serious sin than gossip, which is also included in the prohibition, Lashon Hara. Lashon Hara literally means, Lashon means like language or tongue, Hara means from the word Ra, evil. Relating deprecating facts about a colleague, even if they're true. Lashon Ra does not refer to the invention of lies, because it would sound like evil language, would sound like, you know, uh, um, lying, rather. That is referred to as defamation of character. Rather, one who speaks Lashon Hara, someone who sits and relates, this is what so and so has done, his parents were such and such, this is what I've heard about him, telling uncomplimentary, again, but true things. Concerning this, the person Zom says, may God cut off all guileful lips, the tongues which speak proud things. So here you have codified, based on the verse of Leviticus, that you may not ever say true things if there is ill to be born out of it. You might, you may, you know, anything, even if it's hundred percent true and it's a fact, you may not go ahead and further uh, that information. So putting together both the verse of Leviticus, how my mind is codified it, and the Talmud and Yoma about going and passing on confidential information, we see clearly that just, that there, you know, it's one of the six or thirty commandments, do not go ahead and pass on confidential information, or even neither confidential, even things which are known, but it's something which will be, have a negative effect on the person you're speaking about, you, are, you may not do it. Now obviously, the, the Torah did not speak of it from the concept of rights. The Torah doesn't speak so much of that I, the revealer of the fact, have a right, but rather you, the listener, have an obligation and a slash of prohibition from revealing it further. So, right? so that, that's a little bit of a difference, that the Torah never spoke about what I have as a right, but rather what you have an obligation to do. So, in other words, uh, it's not that, you know, we, this could, you know, in a broader sense, we can speak about this another time, but it's a question of human rights. Is a human right that I have a right to certain things, or you have an obligation to me, to my human rights? So that's, that's a different, it's a different you know, paradigm of how to understand interpersonal rights and relations. So this is seemingly pretty straightforward. If we just do page one, you may never speak evil, you may not pass over information. Everything seems to be pretty straightforward. What happens is, is we get back to Leviticus. And now there's a very interesting juxtaposition. If you take a look at the verse, I only read the first part of the verse. The first part of the verse said, you shall not go around as a gossip monger amongst your people. But then there's a second part of the verse. The second part of the verse says, you shall not stand by the shedding of your fellow's blood, I am the Lord. Which seemingly, the two parts of the verse have nothing to do with each other. The first one is, don't be a gossip monger, and the second one is, not stand idly by. And in the, in like in the uh, shaded area, you'll see it says, Watching your fellow death, whether you're able to save him, for example, if he's drowning in a river, if a wild beast of robbers come upon him, I am the Lord faithful to pay reward and faithful to exact punishment. So, what is the juxtaposition that's going on here? So we're going to see on page 2 in a second that the second part of the verse has a very general meaning to the rabbis in the Talmud, that what you're allowed and what, you should, what, you're, what, you, what obligations you have to your fellow man. 
But here we have the issues that um, come, come often, or often enough, of how do you balance the needs of the individual, or the rights of the individual, who told you something in secret, and the public, or someone else, not even a public, one other person's possible harm. Right, so right, if someone tells you that he's going to rob a bank tomorrow, but it tells you that as, uh, as a rabbi, or, as a, a, or someone confesses to the priest that tomorrow is going to rob the bank, is the, is the priest allowed to warn the bank? Right? Or if um, someone tells the rabbi, yesterday I did X, Y, Z, and now the rabbi can go tell the person who it will who affect, does the rabbi have that obligation? So here you have to weigh the rights of the person who told it to you in confidence versus the, har the protection the, of harm to another to your fellow man. So that is why, I, in, in this verse, you have juxtaposed these two ideas. You're not allowed to ever say anything that anyone ever told you, even if it's true. On the other hand, you have a very strict obligation to make sure that you protect and that no harm comes to any other individual. How do you, what do you do when these two things come to a head? What happens when the only way you can protect someone is revealing something which you know in a way which told you in confidence? And this was the gist of the lawsuit. I don't have, um, it, was, it was, the exact year it was, hold on one second. Um, the lawsuit is quick, on the first page. It was in the early 2000s. You know how to read this better than me. Um, it's, it's called, it was Lightman versus Flam. And the uh, footnotes say, the footnotes say it was uh, 2001, 761NE2D1027. I don't know what that means. So I'm North sure so. The first is the volume. The citation. The right. Northeastern Reporter, and then the page starts. There you go. So you're right. So so if that's where it is. So it's from New York, two thousand and one. How do I have that here? Well, right. yeah. You said at the beginning there's a difference between the, the two distinctions in, of confidentiality. One is a, a legal confidentiality. A rabbi may have an attorney has right. uh, attorney-client privilege. But what you're referring to now must the person specifically say, "I'm telling you this in confidence." Or if you and I are having a conversation, they say, and we're just having a conversation, and I say, I'm going to rob the bank tomorrow. Not as your role as a rabbi. I'm not coming to you as a confident rabbi, but it's a one-on-one -on -one individual, which this seems to be referring to. Correct. Correct. In, in Jewish law, there's no distinction. There's no, in other words, not a right or a privilege that only, you know, you have to invoke. That means, and that was, if you take a look at that case, that went through the first court, I guess the appeals court, and then the New York Court of Appeals, um, the first court found, basically what happened was a woman told, in a, there was a divorce issue between a husband and wife, the wife told the rabbis something, which the rabbis felt they had to tell the husband um, for, to protect him religiously. That was their claim. And so the first court found that the rabbis had breached their, their rabbi, you know, petition, what do they call it, rabbi congregate confidentiality. The second court didn't address the issue. The Senate court found or um, assumed that there was a third person present, and therefore you can't assume client and a rabbi, it wasn't told in confidence, and therefore they threw the court, the case out lacking, and lacking merit because there was a third party in the room. Um, the woman then took it to the Court of Appeals, where the Court of Appeals then discussed the constitutionality of the rabbi client privilege and doesn't apply when the rabbi has a religious obligation. So there are two aspects here. But to answer your question, does um, the Torah, the Torah has, it makes no difference between me and you or between a rabbi and someone else. If you tell someone else something, no one is allowed to repeat that information. So, so then, if you follow this, any conversation that you have, we're, 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 what are we talking about? Uh, you and I are dis discussing the weather of the day. You say you think tomorrow is going to be sunny. I say it's going to be cloudy. I can't go and say the rabbi said, and not rabbi. You know, an individual Beth, said to me. Beth told you. Beth told you. It's going to be. It's going to be. Beth's opinion is tomorrow to be sorry. Right. So you, what you're saying is that you really can't repeat anything that doesn't have to do with Very good. with with being a gossiper or talking about one's personality. Well, when you're not talking about another person, in other in other words, if you say Beth thinks it's going to be sunny tomorrow, that is it's what we call is part. It's not. It's not. You know. 
But if you say, Beth thinks it's going to be sunny tomorrow, oh, Beth thinks it's going to be sunny tomorrow. Where you're automatically you know, saying something negative, a connotation of Beth. Yes, that is considered one of the 613 prohibitions. Now, in the, in the Jewish community, um, I'll, I'll give you a background. There was a rabbi who lived for about 100 years. He died in 1933. His name was Rizal Meir Kagan. His, his name is popularly known as the Chafetz Chaim. He died in 1933. He has an obituary in the New York Times. He was considered the leader of all European Ashkenazi Jewry. His name was Rizal Meir Kagan. He wrote 50, 60 books. But he's known as the name of his most, I guess, most important book, which is a book called Chafetz Chaim, which is uh, literally translated wanting or desiring life. Um, and which comes to the verse of Zavs, who is the man who desires life, right? And it says, who watches his mouth from evil. And he wrote a whole treatise literally about what you're allowed to talk about. And a lot of the things we talk about, you're not allowed to talk about. And in the Jewish community today, in the Orthodox Jewish community today, um, this it, it is very, very popular. His image is almost everywhere, is, is universal. And this is one of the things that, let's say, is very popular today, if you're careful what you speak. Um, but yeah, and that, and he, he himself, that's what we'll get to on page three, he deals with this problem of, first of all, when you got to talk. It's a famous story that he himself worked on himself for many years first, and then they tried to they put it published a book. So all the naysayers of the generation were like, after this book came out, you never let us say anything. You can't have a conversation. Right? So they went over to him and try to get and try to have a conversation with him. And they, they, everywhere he goes, like he, it didn't work. So they said, they finally, they, they're like, he's like, what do you want from me? So he's like, we're trying to trap you. You know, we're trying to see that if you're living up to the book. He says, it's you know, it takes a lot of effort to know what you're allowed to talk about. So that that's the short answer. But yes, that is the correct observation. Okay. So let us see. We're going to skip to uh, Deuteronomy 22 for a second. We'll see Sanhedrin 73. That's the Talmud of Sanhedrin. Whence do we know that if a man sees his fellow drowning, mauled by beasts, or attacked by robbers, he is bound to save him? From the verse, those shall not stand by the blood of the neighbor. So that verse in Leviticus that we saw is a catch-all for making sure that you have to, you have to be proactive in, um, in saving your friend, neighbor, person. This is basically, you know, the good Samaritan laws in Judaism are based on this verse. And then the Talmud goes in, is it derived from this verse? Is it not derived from elsewhere? I mean, that verse in Deuteronomy 22, which we skipped. Whence do we know that one must save his neighbor from the loss of himself, and that shall restore it to him? From that verse, I might think that one is only a personal obligation, but that he's not bound to take the trouble of hiring men. Therefore, the, teachers, the verse teaches us that he must. So we have two verses, one in Leviticus, one in Deuteronomy, to tell us that not only do you have a personal obligation, you even have to spend money to protect your neighbor. And this is very, re now, it's not so relevant. I mean, yes, if you know that the, uh, the army's coming or some band of these is coming, you have to, you have to pay out of pocket to, to, to hire a security guard. But we'll see that this is very relevant when rabbis have to make very tough decisions. That's what we get to at the end. So we see from here that A, you have to save your fellow man from harm, and B, you have to actually be proactive and hire someone and not just do your best. Okay, Maimonides codifies this. Whenever a person can save another person's life, but he fails to, he transgresses a negative commandment. Do not stand idly by while your brother's blood, while your brother's blood is at stake. Similarly, it applies when a person knows of a man of force who has a complaint against a colleague, and he can appease the aggressor on behalf of his colleague, but he fails to do so. So here we see it's not just a concept of armies or wild animals or you know someone with a shotgun. Rather, it's you know, he has a complaint or he's going to harm him in some way and you can stop it. And similarly, in all, in all analogous instances, a person who fails to act, transgresses the commandment, do not stand idly by while your brother's blood is at stake. So, here we have the, we set up the problem. We have, all, and, and again, that's why I think that, you know, the juxtaposition of the Torah is so interesting. And in Leviticus 19.16, we have the first half of the verse saying never talk about anyone, and as Professor Rubensky points out, ever. Never say anything bad about anybody. On the other hand, we have this very clear thing, no matter what, you have to protect your friend and your neighbor from any possible harm. So what if the only way to protect him from harm is to say over something bad? Okay? So the Chavetz Chaim, like I said before, in the laws of Lashon Hara, he sums up seven 
uh, conditions to permit you to say it. In other words, the Chavetz Chaim, um, Rabbi Kagan, this, and almost all deciders of law have decided that the prohibition or the transgression of not saying honestly by trumps the kind of the, the don't be a gossip monger. For, that means gossip monger implies evil, and if you, we can ascertain for 100% certainty that you're doing it for the sake of saving someone, you have left the category of gossip monger and become a great person. If we know that you're saying what you're saying over in order and only to protect somebody else, then you're not a gossip monger. But we have to, how do we know that for sure? So here, it is permissible to speak negatively about a person. One, to help the person, or to help anyone victimized by the person, or to resolve, to resolve um, major disputes, okay? or to enable another person to learn from the mistakes of that person, provided that. Here we go, seven clauses. One's remarks are based on first-hand information and careful investigation. We, are, we tend to make a lot of assumptions in our lives. Okay? Assumptions are not acceptable. So you can only say over facts. Two, it is apparent that this person is wrong. This is, you know, someone wants to, you want to enter a partnership with a you know, you're coming out of law school and you, you met another person and you want to enter a partnership with them. Or you want to you meet someone, you want to date somebody, right? And someone saw them do, I saw that person do something the other day, you know, right? And if it wasn't 100% wrong, but it looked wrong, it didn't, it wasn't 100%, it wasn't great. No, can't say it. And the person has spoken to but refuses to change his behavior. That means, if you, even if the person was 100% wrong, but you didn't go first, a guy said, listen, you know, did something wrong. Before I, I tell another person that you did something wrong, I have to at least make them, when it's possible, to tell you that you're doing something wrong. Four, the statement we made will be true and accurate. You can't go and embellish the facts. You can't say, oh yeah, that guy, you know, he is not careful with money. Where all you know is, he owes a guy five bucks. You know, he never paid, his friend, you know for a fact, he never paid his friend five dollars. And he owes him five dollars, and he's being a not nice guy about it. You can't go, he is not good with money. I wouldn't go near him. You know, that's an embellishment of the facts. The intent, now this is, this is the tough one in my opinion. The intent of the speaker is for constructive purpose only. And there is a reasonable chance the intended goal will be accomplished. If you, rabbi, or not rabbi, if you professor, don't like someone, and even though you when you go ahead and say someone to something to someone about that person, it is there is some purpose, but part of it is because you really don't like the guy, then you're still a gossip monger. That means you have to be purely altruistic in your telling over. To get out of the category of of gossip monger, you have to be certain that you're doing it really just to protect the, the person that harm, no harm should befall them. Six, there is no alternative means by which you'll bring about the intended result. This is again. Uh, in the Orthodox Jewish world, where there's, I want, there's no arranged marriages, but there's arranged dating. That means no one, no one tells their son or daughter who to marry, but they, the, the way you get a date is that you don't go to a bar, you don't go to a club, you don't meet them in school. Rather, your parents come to and says, you know, our friends, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Goldberg, have a daughter, and someone suggested, you know, their daughter for you. Or, right, so, so how it happens is, so for example, when you have a child or children about, you know, about in marriageable age, you go to uh, Professor Rubensheet and say, uh, I heard you have a son, or I heard you have a neighbor, or you have a neighbor who's, you know, I've been looking at their child, tell me about your neighbors. Are they good people? How are they, how is, how are they doing? You know, do they lease their own car, or do they own their car? You know, all you try to find their information, because, you know, possible, you know, that, that's, so before you suggest these future shidduch, they call it, future um, um, shidduch is, a uh, match to your, to your child, you find that all about the information, right? So now, let's say, this, this is very relevant, let's say you know about that family, there's something, stay away, stay away from that, stay away from that family. You don't want to be part of that family. Or, it can happen here, you're, you're, you dated uh, Joe last year, last semester, and now your friend is interested in dating Joe, and you know from dating Joe that really, you know, really bad idea, bad idea. So now you go to your friend, your friend says, tell me about Joe. Now, I understand what you're gonna say, is you're gonna say that, right? it's truth. You know it first-hand information, it's true. You're saving your friend. 
But you could say, I don't think it's for you. Or you could say, let me tell you everything that happened. So you may not do that. According to, again, you may say, I don't think it's for you. But you may not say, he did X, Y, Z, and all these things. Even though it's factual, even though it's true, even though it's stopping someone from harm, but you can, if there's an alternative mean to stop the harm, again, your only goal is to stop the harm from coming about. Yeah? Well, you say, you say, okay, you know, look, I don't think it's for you. And, but if they push back... The yeah, okay, obviously, if they're not going to... What are you going to say? So then you have to make a judgment that's which is the way to stop it or not. Okay. And then last, no undo harm will be caused by the statement. Okay. So far, so good. Now we get to the real, the, the tricky problem. So now we have a problem. Now we have a problem. Let's say you're a rabbi, or not a rabbi, a lawyer, um, and you have this problem. Someone told you something in confidence, and according to Jewish law, you have to go and say it. So for, you have, you have, for whatever reason, you have to go out and say it. So the case there that, you know, is in, um, in record is, again, this woman in a marriage dispute told the rabbi something in confidence, they felt religiously they had to protect the husband, and they went ahead and told the husband. Okay? Now here the question is, what if the rabbi go, knows? Let, pretend now, pretend you're the rabbi, you're the lawyer. If you go ahead and tell this, you're gonna lose your job, you lose your license, you're gonna get this bar, you're gonna lose your congregation. Any any of those scenarios. Are you obligated? Again, again it says Leviticus 19:16, you have to. You're not a gossip monger because you're only doing it for altruistic purposes. But it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you dearly. It might cost you your job. It might, you might be sued in court. You have to pay a fine. You, all the, you might lose your congregation. Who knows? What is your obligation in such a situation? Okay, that is, you know, the first part is pretty obvious. You shouldn't be a gossip monger. Never say anything you're not allowed to say. You have to protect your neighbor. When those two come in contact, if all the conditions are met, you have to, have to, not just allowed to, have to tell. But what do you do if it's going to cost you money? Future, little money, a lot of money, future job, harm, all the possibilities. So I'm going to, before we get to the, uh, the last page, the addendum, I want to read it to you above here the, on the bottom of page three, where it says, if a mission says, if the mission talking about um, there's one of the one of the 613 positive commandments, one of the commandments in the Torah, is to return a lost object. You have to, if you find something on the street and it's returnable, you have a commandment to return it. In Hebrew, it's called Hashavat Aveda, returning the lost object. It's a beautiful thing. You're supposed to have a lost and found. You're supposed to try hard to return things. If you returned it, let's say here we're talking about if a, if a little sheep ran away. If you returned it and it ran away, you returned it and it ran away. So you know, your neighbor's sheep keeps running into your neighbor's dog, keeps running into your yard. And you can just close your eyes, let it just go, and you know, well, it's not your business. The answer is, no, it is your business. You have, a, you have a commandment to return your neighbor's dog. But every day, they leave the door open, and the dog comes into my yard. And every day, I have this commandment. Yeah, even four or five times, he is still bound to restore it, for it is written, they shall surely restore them. But what if you say, listen, every day, I've got to catch his dog. I'm going to be late for the bus, I'm going to miss the train, etc., etc. So then, even so, you know, if it's going to cost me money, do I have to do it? If his lost time is worth a seller, seller is just a coin of the day, an ancient coin, he must not demand give me a seller. You can't ask for, you can't ask for, for compensation. But, but is paid as a laborer. You can ask for basic, you know, minimal wage. Labor, that's how they said minimal wage back then, what a day laborer gets. You can't ask for real compensation, but you can ask for basic compensation. But now, here's a tricky point. If a bet that is present means that there's a court there, and a court, it doesn't have to be a literal sitting court, it means any three um, adult males, he may stipulate in the presence and say, I am only doing this on the condition that I get what I want. You know, my, I, I charge $100 an hour. Not, not daily labor wage. But if there is no besom for four whom he to stipulate, his own takes precedence. That means then your life takes precedence. So if it's totally, if, it, if you're gonna miss a train, then your life takes precedence. If you say, listen, it's worth to miss a train for hundred dollars an hour, then only if you have a court or three males to go and testify in front of. But if you go ahead and do it after the fact, post facto, you can't demand money. Only like a day labor. So this is regarding is not regarding the laws that we're talking about. But from here we see the the in, the connection between demanding wages or. Um, um, accepting loss versus 
versus doing what's bound on you. So if you take a look at the last page of the addendum, um, Rabbi Brody, who was the who was on the best in of America, best in meaning the religious court of America, Yona Reese, who still is, Nathan Diemant, who is a famous lawyer, um, set out some guidelines. And they're very interesting. So I'll just read a few of them. You know, Through a conference told to me, Rabbi is aware of the fact that physical harm will befall another. If the rabbi reveals the confidence, he will run the risk of suffering financial harm through a lawsuit for damages related to the breach of confidence. In this case, many Allah authorities and many rabbis rule that danger to the life or physical well-being of another takes precedence over one's own financial needs. That means you're going to lose your job. You're going to get sued big time. But physical harm of someone else is so, based on, again, the verse of Leviticus 19.16, is your obligation to prevent irrelevant. While one may find halachic authorities who rule that the obligation to save the life of another is suspended in the case of serious financial loss, it is improper for rabbis to function in accordance with that view. So this paper makes the case that there are some authorities, but the, the, the conduct that is expected of rabbis is to prevent harm irrelevant of their own financial loss. Number two. Through a confidence told him a rabbi is aware of the fact that improper financial harm will befall another. So, first one is my financial loss versus your physical loss. Then your physical loss beats my financial loss, and I really have to do whatever I can to stop your physical loss, even though I will pay with that with my financial loss. But now, it's my financial loss versus your financial loss. That's a whole different question. Now, it could be you lose $100,000, and I'll lose $10,000, but now it's sort of a, it's different than your physical loss than my financial loss. So again, through a confidence told him a rabbi is aware of the fact that the proper financial harm will fall another. If the rabbi reveals the confidence, he will run the risk of suffering financial harm through a lawsuit, etc. In this case, if the financial harm is severe and likely, many Allah authorities will the one is exempt from the duty to prevent financial harm to another. When the financial harm to oneself through his activity is greater than 20% of one's worth, including future income. So that means if you're a, a rabbi of a, of a shul, of a synagogue that pays you very well, or if you're a campus rabbi here at Torah Law School, they pay you extremely well, so uh, then, you know, you have to make the balance. So if you're preventing a guy from X amount of dollars, but you're only going to lose, you're only going to get sued, and, the, and you, you know, you speak to your, all the, your consultants here in the law school, they tell you, yeah, it'll cost you 100 grand. 100 grand, uh, what I make, that's not 20%. So then, then you should go ahead and do it. But if it's 20, 100 grand, it's much more than 20%, then you shouldn't go do it. We get this figure 20% from another, I didn't have a chance to fuck out because I was running a little bit late yesterday, but um, there is a concept of 20%, one, that one is not allowed to give charity more than 20%. One should give 10% to charity, one's allowed to give up to 20%, one may not give more than 20% to charity. So, uh, for those of you transgressing this, uh, this uh, prohibition, please speak to me later. I will tell you where to you know, take the money later. But as a rule, we have that, re that when God gave you money, He wants you to give charity, He also wants you to have it. And you should not give more than 20%. They speak about billionaires, you know, or those people who have, you know, does it apply to them? We'll speak about it when we talk about charity. Yeah? That's what I was going to ask. What about it's like somebody... Yeah, Bill Gates is a lot of people, you know, and, and, and um, what's the name? Warren Buffett can give you know who you know as he said if he gives ninety nine percent of his money away he's still doing well. So that's where it comes from. So since you're not you're charity more than twenty percent, so to here when it's another person's financial <coughs> loss versus my financial loss, I'm allowed to give up to twenty percent, and I should. Now the last case is the case that was the case in, in Enlightenment versus Flam was um, religious. So we have physical harm, financial harm, and religious harm. So let's say, I don't want to pick anyone in the room, but let's say Mr. 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 and Mrs. Smith are having a, an argument, they're getting divorced, and Mrs. Smith, who's divorced her husband, wants to stick at him, and now she's going to buy the, the non-kosher meat, tell him it's kosher meat, and he's going to eat kosher meat just so that her husband, you know, she's, and then after the meal, she goes, you know what you just ate, ha <laughs> ha, gotcha, right? right? And she tells this to her friend, her neighbor, the rabbi, irrelevant, and now this person, told in confidence, Right? Her, she told her lawyer. She told the lawyer, you know what I'm going to do tomorrow? I'm going to really get him. So now the lawyer, who's religious, has a debate. What am I supposed to do? If I actually really tell the husband, I have to prevent him from eating, not kosher. Correct? But if I tell him, I have confidentiality. She, when the husband says, 
I'm not hungry tonight. I don't want to eat. I don't want to eat. And she goes, wait a second. Somebody told you. And she figures out it's the lawyer. Now she's going to sue the lawyer for breach of confidentiality. What's the lawyer supposed to do? Through a confidence told me, a rabbi, again, a rabbi is, is not limited to a rabbi, is aware of the fact that religious harm will befall another. If the rabbi reveals the confidence, he'll run the risk of suffering financial harm through a lawsuit. Assuming that the information revealed to the rabbi is reliable as a matter of Jewish law, the rabbi has an obligation to take steps to protect another from religious harm. However, if the financial harm that would be suffered by the rabbi as a result of the divulging of the information is severe and likely, a claim could be made that the rabbi would be exempt from the duty to prevent religious harm to another because of the intense financial harm that will fall the rabbi. Of course, as we pointed out in the previous section, number one, such exemption would only be applicable in case of severe financial duress. So again, 20%. So if the lawyer will be breach of confidentiality and disbarred and never have a future income, that would be severe financial distress. If it's just a penalty, but they won't get disbarred because you go to the, the board and you explain to them why, you know, the professional board, you explain to them why you did it, and they will have a sympathetic ear and it will only cost you a fine. Additionally, then it's a question. Additionally, rabbis should hesitate to avoid doing what is religiously proper out of fear of punishment from the government. So this is, this is they threw this line in for rabbis, not for lawyers. So rabbis should try to always do what's right and, you know, even, and disregard their own you know, future financial status. But as a lawyer, this is, I would say as a religious lawyer, this is, I would say, the most uh, difficult when someone tells us something in confidence, a religious law, so that, and then you, the, you're going to have to explain to the board that hears your, your hearing why you breached confidentiality, why religiously you have to um, go ahead and reveal that fact. So if you're really worried about your future income for the rest of your life, there is what to rely on. However, um, if it's only a, a fine, and it's fine's not too great, you would have an obligation to go ahead and reveal that information. Okay, that is the basic overview uh, as I see it. Yes, questions? Yeah, but like as a lawyer, if someone tells me that they're going to commit, I can't reveal, if somebody told me they committed a crime in the past, I can't reveal it. But if they tell me they're going to commit a, a future crime, that I can disclose. But I'm not sure that the rules of confidentiality, uh, Future, a future crime would be one that's like going to result in life or loss of life. I don't know. I have this professor Rayfield. He would know this but, better than me. Because that's but, what I think we're But what um, I'm saying is that the, you know the disciplinary board may yeah. not be too sympathetic, and it's like, well, you know what? It's a religious thing. It's not correct. There's not, you know, there wasn't danger of losing his life or his limb or anything like that. A, a hundred. That's exactly the point. That it, it comes out that it, that's where I guess the issue is. When you have a religious future harm, future harm there, and, and the disciplinary board might not be sympathetic, then you have a real decision to make that where you have an obligation, could be you have a very strong obligation to go ahead and reveal it, while at the same time, your future financial status is in doubt. And that's a very big dilemma that I hope never to have to counsel anyone what to do. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. What is, what is it for, I mean, American law or professional responsibility? Does, does religious, uh, the court, the court of appeals at the end of the day in that court seems to have tried to walk the line that they said that the rabbi's um, religious obligation, they, they, they don't want to get involved in telling what a rabbi has to do because that would be intrusion on his religious demands. And therefore they can't say that it's a breach of confidentiality. But, yeah, it's a tough. It's it's so it's oh, difficult. You. But I mean, you know, the attorney has it a lot easier in many respects because we're prohibited from. Well, you're prohibited as well. Right. I'm also I'm just as prohibited as it is the same. Prohibited as well. That's same. Right. It's yeah. the same. You know. But that's that's what happens when when someone tells you, uh, and then that's what happens. But but you're prohibited. You're prohibited from actually more as a rabbi than I'm prohibited as an attorney. Why? Because there are yeah. There's like a Jewish attorney. I'm thinking of the issue of the non-kosher. Non right, that case. Yeah. If someone if someone tells me that um, they're going to feed their their spouse for the divorce and non-kosher meat right. today, I'm actually prohibited from doing anything. Correct. You're not. I technically well, that's that was the question here. That was this court case. She was going to harm him religiously. 
The rabbis told the husband to prevent that harm from happening. The first court found the rabbis guilty. But the appeal the second court, court said that there was no confidentiality because there they happened to be a third person in the room. And the, New York, the Court of Appeals found that they didn't they, that there was too, an overreach of the court to say what the rabbis' religious beliefs were. Something like something like that. But what, yeah, they so didn't they, want to interfere. They didn't want to interfere. But I, I don't know, you know, as what if you were religious what if you were religious you you as an attorney if you would say something and claim religious the so, so so my confidentiality is more stringent than right. yours in that Correct. regard. Correct. Because right. Because the assumption is there's also I don't know, is there a third party exclusion of confidentiality when there's a in, 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 to to attorney? Yeah. I mean yeah. when, if there's another party there's another party assume that the conversation is not confused. So that so there, that's there was a whole discussion of when it comes to what if what if they you know um, this woman what happened was she brought her mother with her to speak to the rabbis. So um, many felt that that's it's a normal thing to speak to your rabbi with your mother because she was divorcing her husband. So that they, just because the third person who didn't breach confidentiality because she was it's a part of how you speak to a rabbi. Now, and the courts didn't want to get into how you know all that whole question. With the physical harm, I know that you know. That's model rules, right. aside from religious obligations, you may disclose a future harm, but isn't there a higher standard for Judaism because life is, you know, the right. value of life yeah. is... So that, and you get basically, yeah, so that's what we said here, that if it's physical harm, you have a duty to... So you actually have, it's not may, you have to. Have to, yeah. Okay. In Judaism, there's, there's no may. It's either you have to or you're not allowed to. <laughs> there's, there's no, you know, may. Yeah. And also... Assume that you did do this, and you, you, uh, you're a religious lawyer, you do disclose, you're brought up on charges, but you, they file agreements against you, you go before the grievance board, maybe they'll be sympathetic, and maybe they'll, maybe they'll maybe, uh, put a small fine on you, but you could be the, while, while the monetary loss may be minimal, the damage to your reputation, right. people aren't going to trust you. Right. That's the risk you have, or could, or should, or possibly take. <laughs> Thank you.